if he's around already. Yeah, Jeff yeah. is here. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Uh, okay, let me share my screen. Okay, that seems to work. Ready. So next in line is Jeff Pennington. He's gonna tell us about uh, quantum extremal surfaces without a path and where we can find dangerous pythons. Please take it away. Great. Okay, so thank you very much indeed to the organizers for inviting me to talk. Um, sorry, I can't be in person in Brazil. Uh, okay, so this is, this is gonna be a talk on, on some work with Meta Engelhardt and Arvind Tavassan McGavin uh, that came out last month. Um, and uh, it's going to be a talk, as, as may be clear from the title, that's, that's not actually going to be about evaporating black holes, it's going to be about non-evaporating black holes. Uh, but I wanted to start by, by very briefly reviewing the, the hopefully familiar story back from, from 2019, originally from these two papers, about uh, quantum extremal surfaces and what they tell us about evaporating black holes. Okay. Um, so to make an ADS black hole evaporate, what you do is you couple it to some auxiliary system that's, that's normally called, called a bath. Um, and what you find, the sort of technical central feature of these papers, so we find this so-called quantum extremal surface, this, this dot here, um, which is just an, an extremum of, of generalized entropy area over 4G plus, plus bulk entanglement entropy, so just the bulk entropy of of everything between this surface and the, the, the boundary of the original, original system. Um, and yeah, just, just by finding an extreme of this surface, then, then extreme of this generalized entropy, then we, we find out all sorts of properties about how the information in the interior of the black hole ends up being encoded in this sort of combined black hole bath uh, bipartite system. Um, so just to briefly review some of the things you get out of this, uh, via this, the so-called QES description, generalization of Rio um, of Engelhardt and Moore, uh, then you find that the, the entanglement entropy of the, the radiation in the black hole, and the black hole itself follows the so-called page curve, goes up until the page time and then goes back down. Um, we also have this idea of, of the entanglement wedge reconstruction um, that involves a lot of people, but particular, there was a beautiful paper by John Carlo and Wall that sort of first proved it. Um, and in this case, what that, that tells you is the so-called hayden Preskill decoding criteria, um, which is just a precise statement about, about sort of when and how information comes out. Basically, you need to wait until after the page time, and then there's a scrambling delay for in particular information to turn after that. Um, and it also tells you that that, that the way that information gets out is what's called state dependent. You, you can only, you know, if there's a couple of qubits you don't know about the state, then you can find them out. But if you don't know anything at all about the state, you can't find it out. The, the information is only accessible if you know a decent amount already. Um, and the, the sort of final, final thing yeah, that I'm going to mention uh, follows from this thing called the Python's Lunch Conjecture. Uh, there was recently a paper I wrote with uh, Brown, Darby, and Siskins. And what that tells you in this case is the complexity of reconstructing this information, say in Hayden Prescott and so on, is actually exponentially hard. It's exponential in, in one energy Newton. Um, okay, so this, this one QES, this one technical contribution finding this surface uh, just has all these, these huge consequences. Um, there is one very brief note I want to say before I move on to, to non-evaporating black holes. Just there's a slight difference between these sort of points one and two I made here and point three, uh, which is that really there's two quantum extremal surfaces um, in an evaporating black hole. Um, there's this surface, I've, I've, it's now very famous, I've just talked about it so much. And there's another surface, which is just the empty set. It's, it's not really a surface at all, but it, it, it is extremal in a sort of trivial sense. Um, and what matters, what, what causes a lot of this stuff is working out which of these two extremal surfaces has smaller generalized entropy is the so-called minimal QES. Okay, so, so points one and two follow from basically tracking which of the two quantum extremal surfaces is minimal. And before the page time, it's this, this trivial empty set surface. And after the page time, it's this, this non-minimal, non-trivial one in the horizon black hole. Point three is a bit different, and point three actually follows just from the existence of the second 
non-mineral QES. So it's following from the opposite QES from, from point one and two. Um, but given one of the QES is this trivial, then, then at a technical level, really, they all just follow from, from having finding this non-trivial QES. Okay, so that is that is five minutes of talking about a battery in black holes. Now, now let me move on to my, my real interest for this talk, which is, of course, not evaporated black holes. So in this case, we're just taking some black hole in the EDS, we're not coupling it to any bath or, or anything crazy like that. Um, and we're just letting it sit there for some long time, maybe more than a, a scram of time. Or so. so let's think about, about you know, what we have and what we don't have out of the, the sort of interesting features from bath that were, were explained by um, this quantum extremal surface. Well, obviously, we don't, we don't have a cage curve. This is just some, some pure state that's just sitting being a pure state for all time. And there's no interesting, interesting transition happening there. Um, so that one we can, we can rule out. Um, OK, what about point two, how, how information is encoded? Well, we don't have the sort of two systems of black hole and bath with it potentially being encoded in one and the other. Uh, but we can still have some notion of, of state dependence. This goes back to, to Raju and Papa Jesus, um, back in early part of last decade. Um, and in particular, we definitely still have, uh, point three, we still have exponential reconstruction context. Uh, specifically, um, if I have some, some interior partner of a Hawking mode sitting like this, then, then the sort of usual methods we have for reconstructing that will not work. And there's, there's very good evidence that it should be exponentially hard to reconstruct that on the boundary. OK. Um, so it sort of seems like we still have a lot of these features that the QES explains so nicely for evaporating black holes with bars. Uh, but we have a problem. And that problem is that, that in this state, there is absolutely, definitely, certainly no cons um, 10 second proof of, of uh, why that's true. Um, and that's just that if our black hole is formed from collapse, uh, then the entire space time is causally separated. It's in the causal future of the boundary. Um, and by the quantum focusing conjecture or the generalized second law, there's, there's various ways you can prove it. But a quantum extremal surface can never be causally separated from the boundary. Uh, roughly speaking, you know, if, I, if I shoot light rays from my causal extremal surface, then the, the generalized entropy always gets smaller as I do so. Um, but that means it can't get out of the asymptotic boundary because the, the surface. Uh, but we don't have a quantum surface. So it seems like maybe we need some whole new explanation, some second, some second way of, of explaining the exponential complexity and so on that, that um, it's just completely different to, to the usual one. Um, to the, the evaporating black hole one, which obviously would be a bit unsatisfying. And sort of, you know, how many times would we have to keep doing that? And actually, there's, there's something a bit stronger here, um, which is that, that in the paper Netter and Arvin and I put out in February, we actually proved um, that so long as the bulk physics in your ADS-CFT space time looks classical, uh, then, in fact, there can never be another explanation for exponential complexity. That exponential complexity can only come from having some, some extremal surface and trying to reconstruct stuff behind that. Right? There's, there's no alternative, alternative possibilities, at least in the case where the bulk physics looks classic. So, of course, that's not the case here. The bulk physics is, is inherently quantum. You know, there's, there's the trans planckian problem and so on. That you, you just wouldn't have classically. Um, so again, you could say, okay, sure, maybe that's that's true classically, but maybe once you include quantum effects, then then there's sort of no no analogous version of, the, of our theorem, and, and you again just need a different explanation for the exponential complexity. So that that would be um, a set of answers, um, but it would be a pretty unsatisfying set of answers. I think I think hopefully you would agree. Um, so now I've set up the the sort of central conflict. Uh, of my my narrative, uh, then I can sort of introduce the resolution, 
um, and tell you how it's, it's all going to work out and everyone's going to get home safely and, and live happily ever after. Uh, and that's the, the really quantum extreme all services are always still going to be, be secretly, you know, making everything work and, and manipulating everything behind the scenes. Uh, they're just going to be doing so in a slightly more subtle way. Um, so let me now, now lay out uh, our claim for resolution to this story. Um, so the first thing to note is that um, when we talk about reconstructing operators, we can never mean sort of that, that reconstruction doesn't have to depend only on a single state, right? Like uh, sort of by definition, if you, if you want to do some reconstruction, uh, then, then in the language of Almiri, Jong, and Harlow, uh, you need to be considering an entire so-called code subspace states, an entire set of your, your black hole is in one of those states, but you want to distinguish them all using, using some operators, some set of states that differ in this, this degree of freedom that you want to reconstruct. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully that's a, a familiar story to most people. Um, but the, the, the key point, and maybe less familiar, and, and unfortunately I won't have time to, to really deeply justify it for you, uh, but it's like vaguely intuitive. But if we want to know the complexity of some, some reconstruction of, of, of a particular operator for some particular code subspace, then what we've got to do is we've got to look for quantum external surfaces to the maximally mixed state within that code subspace. Okay, so, so the, the operator is not associated, the reconstruction is not associated to a single state, but a code subspace of states. Entanglement wedges are associated to a single state. So you might say, well, like, which state in the code subspace you can be using? There's, there's a whole, infinitely many of them. The right answer is that you should look at a maximally mixed state in that code subspace and look for quantum extremal surfaces for that maximally mixed state. Okay, so this, this follows by just Look, going carefully through the, the sort of original analysis, the original arguments for this, this Python's lunch conjecture that QAS has explained exponential complexity. Um, but I'm not going to have time to really go deep into those arguments. They involve well, tensor network analogies and, and there's various other, other pieces of evidence you can argue for. Um, but the, the evidence is as strong as the evidence that this Python's lunch conjecture is true. Um, Okay, so then the final statement that will we'll resolve all the problems and make everything work is that any code subspace, any code subspace where the, the interior degrees of freedom, the interior partners of the Hawking modes, are like some excitable degree of freedom in that, that code subspace, they're included in that code subspace, will always have a quantum extremal surface that is maximally mixed state. So even though the actual specific state you get from like forming a black hole from collapse, which you know always has has this interior Hawking partner and this exterior Hawking partner in in sort of the same fixed uh, entangled state that doesn't have a quantum extremal surface. But if we allow those degrees of freedom to be part of our so code subspace and to be excited and so on, then the maximally mixed code state in that code subspace always does have a quantum extremal surface. And this explains why reconstruction is so difficult. It also explains state dependence and so on. Okay. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that at least for small code subspaces, this is going to be a non minimal QES. The, the minimal QES is still going to be, be the empty set. Um, so reconstruction will still be possible. It will just be exponentially hard. Okay. Any questions about that? Just, just briefly, and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to sort of focus the rest of this talk on. on you know, explaining this point for you and showing showing why there's a QES in these maximum mix states. Okay, great. Okay, so so why is there this this sort of secret QES that we we don't don't see in the sort of state we usually consider that's formed from collapse, uh, but it is there when you you actually try to to reconstruct QES. Um, well, the first thing to note is that if this this a particular Hawking mode and its, its interior partner in our code subspace, uh, then in the maximally mixed state in those comes that code subspace, they're not going to be entangled anymore, right? In the, the usual post-collapse state, they're entangled, they purify one another, but then in, in uh, this, this maximally mixed state in our code subspace, they're just going to be in some, some mixed state. We're going to have no correlations between them. 
Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to consider some surface gamma. So it's going to be a sphere. It's going to be sitting a bit inside the horizon here. Uh, and it's going to be a very, very long way into the past, really far into the distance. And then we're going to imagine it perturbing it sort of outwards, either to future light light direction or past light light direction. And we're going to see what's happening to the, the generalized entropy when we do so. OK, let's start by imagining perturbing it a bit in this direction, in the, the future outwards direction. What's going to happen? Well, we're in the interior of a black hole, and it's a, a fixed size black hole. Um, so the area is just going to get smaller when we do so. OK, so as we move, that's just a, a feature being the interior of a black hole, being trapped surface, um, classically. Uh, but it turns out for, for perturbing in that direction, the, the area change is going to be the dominant effect. It's going to have a much bigger effect than the, the bulk entropy change. And so, so perturbing in that future outwards direction is going to make the generalized entropy small. OK, say that the, the quantum future outwards expansion is strictly negative. OK, what about if we perturb the, the some other way in the, the past outwards direction? Well, in this case, obviously, uh, you know, we're getting outwards to larger radius. So the, the, the change in the area from this little perturbation is going to be positive. Um, but on the other hand, you've got to remember that this surface, we've moved way into the distant distance past. OK? And as the surface, as we, as we go back further into the, the past, parallel transporting everything along light rays, then everything gets sort of closer and closer to the horizon, right? The, the areas of surfaces all basically become the horizon surface. Uh, the, the, everything comes, comes at the horizon area radius. And so this sort of change delta A from perturbing outwards gets exponentially suppressed by the time that our surface gamma has, is, is in the past. OK, so if it's, if it's really far back in the past, this effect becomes, becomes very small. There's another effect, and that effect comes from, from looking at the change in the bulk entropy. So remember that this mode, this interior Hawking mode, was not entangled with its exterior partner. That means as we move the surface gamma outwards and into the past a little bit, then uh, we're going to be losing the entropy, the bulk entropy of this mode, which isn't entangled with anything else outside. Uh, and so that's going to decrease the bulk entropy as we, we perturb it outwards. OK, and this effect is not exponentially suppressed. It's just still there no matter how far we get into the past. And so if we go far enough back in the past, this change is going to dominate. And the overall effect is that, again, uh, going outwards is going to make SGN smaller. The, the quantum past outwards expansion is going to be negative. OK, so that was, that was probably the, the most technical part of the talk. I was just trying to give a heuristic picture of why it happens. Obviously, the, the actual arguments are a lot more technical. Um, but basically, the, the summary is that we found this surface gamma uh, that's deep in the past, inside the interior of the black hole. And if we move it outwards, either to the future or the past, then it gets smaller generalized entropy. OK, it's going to turn out this is going to get us a long way towards finding a, a quantum external surface. Um, so let me explain how, how, how it does so, because you know, so far, we've not actually found a quantum extreme surface. Uh, we've, we've, like, like the quantum extreme surface has, would have delta S gen B, B0 at leading order for any perturbation. Um, but it turns out that, that having this gamma with its properties uh, will always lead us to finding a quantum extreme surface that is outside gamma, like further, further out than gamma. OK, so let me explain how that works. It's a, a sort of cute little argument involving what's called restricted maximum. So the first step is we have our surface gamma, and we're just going to consider a Cauchy slice for the exterior of gamma. OK, starting gamma going out, blue dot. We're just going to minimize over all surfaces within that Cauchy slice. Then finally, with step three, we're going to take that minimal SGN surface, and we're going to maximize its generalized entropy over all possible Cauchy slices going outwards from gamma. Turns out this is a, a well-defined thing um, that basically you know, doesn't, doesn't become badly behaved or anything. Um, and it's pretty clear from the, the, the variational sort of construction we use that 
one of two things has to be true. Either this surface is just extreme, um, and then we're done, or it would have to it would have to be sort of impossible to to fully vary it in in every direction. I it would have to be on the boundary of the sort of allowed like region. It would have to either be touching gamma, or be like have part of it light like separated from gamma. Okay, but this is where the fact that we found these these outward expansions from gamma and found them both to be strictly negative is going to save us. Okay, it can't we can't have it for example touch gamma here because by definition, put them perturbing it slightly in any outwards direction will decrease this gen. And so it will always, it, you know, surface touching gamma can never be minimal within any Cauchy slice. And you can make That's a similar enough. argument that. Uh, uh, you have five minutes left. Great. Great. Yeah. So you can make a, a similar argument that it can't be light like separated from gamma. Okay. So the fact that we found a surface gamma with these properties means that there must exist a quantum extremal surface outside it, the, and, and you know, that quantum extremal surface will explain the exponential complexity and so on. Okay, so so it's reasonably good timing because I'm I'm just going to make some some brief final final summary here. Um, so okay, so what have what have we learned here? What have I what have I not told you about and so on? Uh, I think the big takeaway of, of this paper and and you know what we we sort of advertise it as. Is that the the lessons about black into black holes from from studying quantum extremal surfaces aren't just some very specific feature of what happens when you make a black hole and ADS evaporate by coupling to a bath. They're not even a specific to like evaporating black holes, maybe in flat space or whatever. Um, they're really a very general story uh, about about you know that they explain the the weird uh, information theoretic and, and sort of. Sort of reconstruction properties of, of, of black holes. There's there's always a QES somewhere that's that's responsible. Um, so yeah, even though non-evaporating black holes that have been formed from collapse don't have a quantum extremal surface, uh, the moment you you consider a code subspace that allows excitations of interior Hawking partners, uh, then the maximally mixed state of that code subspace will have a QES, and this explains the exponential complexity and also the state dependence, which I didn't really talk about, but it's also important of, of trying to reconstruct those interior modes. Um, so a load of stuff in the paper I didn't talk about. I, I encourage you to, to, to go read it. Um, but in particular, you know, I, I just sort of said some, some vague words about exponential complexity here. There's actually precise formulas you can give that, that will exactly give you the exponent depending on you know, the size of the code subspace you're considering, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's also you know, other examples of, of, of black holes being weird and being hard to, to reconstruct the interior, et cetera. Uh, particularly this paper from 2019 by, by some computer scientists, Bulan, Fethman, and Basarani. Uh, and again, it, it all gets explained by very similar stories about, about secret quantum extremal surfaces that, that aren't there in, in the states you naively consider, but when you consider the right state, then you you uh, you do find them. Um, yeah, so so please read the paper. Um, but I just want to want to finally end on on something that I think otherwise someone will, will ask me as a question. It's a, it's a pretty natural question. Um, so why did we why did we need to do all this? Why did we need to to start explicitly talking about code subspace and and you know, reconstructing interior hockey modes before before this QES appeared, right? For an, for an evaporating black hole, you just you just use the original post collapse state, and and you already have a QES, and, and you don't need to do any of this this rigmarole. Um, aren't we just like you know desperately trying to trying to come up with something new to to fix the problem? Um, so the answer is no. If you if you want to do the evaporating black hole calculations correctly. Uh, then if you're, you're trying to ask a question about like reconstruction complexity, about, about whether reconstruction is possible, um, then you do need to consider maximally mixed states in an appropriate, your, your, your particular choice of, of code subspace to get the right answer. Um, but of course, for evaporating black holes, you, you have weird stuff going on, like the page curve, et cetera, even before you do that, even if you're just considering a single state and you're not talking about reconstruction at all. Um, on the other hand, not about putting black holes, then there's nothing really weird going on until you start thinking about these interior Hawking partners. For example, if you just think about some, some object being thrown into a black hole, 
Uh, for an evaporating black hole, that becomes exponentially complex to reconstruct, but for, for a non-evaporating black hole, it, it's easy. Um, so, you know, the, the sort of lesson here is that, that quantum extremal surfaces appear exactly when they're needed, but not before or not after. They're, they're, they're like a wizard in Lord of the Rings. They, they show up uh, exactly, precisely when they mean to. Um, if, if there's weird stuff going on, there'll be a QES that's causing it. Uh, but if there's no weird stuff going on, probably not a QES. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, that's all. Thanks, uh, Jeff, for a really, really good talk. And again, well timed. And I can already see Dan as his hand up. Um, hi, hi, Jeff. Yeah. So there's a so um, in this maximally mixed state where you allow both the interior exterior modes to be uh, entangled with the reference system. Um, I'm curious. So one way you could try to think about that is you could say in that state, those modes aren't entangled. So there should be some kind of firewall, at least for the modes that you allow to be activated in the code subspace. But then I could also say, no, 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 you know, entanglement equals geometry and the interior mode is now really the thing in the reference system that the exterior mode is entangled with. Do you, do you have an opinion about which way is the right way to think about that state or maybe they're both right depending where you got it from or something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me, I feel like there's, there's a few sub questions in there. So let me try to answer them one by one. If I forget one, then, then remind me. Uh, okay, so the, the question of whether there's a firewall or not, uh, I think people use different, different words to, to being firewall uh, in the sense that, you know, they're not entangled anymore, then, then there's, yeah, there's always a firewall. Uh, in the sense of will you get vaporized if you fall in, uh, then it depends when you fall in, right? So, so if you fall in at the time that we're, we're you know, these are IR modes, um, then it's fine. You'll, you'll just see that they're not entangled, but nothing, nothing crazy will happen to you. If you like, evolved a while back in time, back towards where this, this quantum extremal surface is showing up, um, then yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll hit some sort of foul. But you see in the other way of um, thinking about it though, like the old black hole, then you would say, even if you jump in early, you don't hit a firewall because really the, the, that interior mode is now encoded out in the reference system, right? Yeah, so, so okay, yeah. I mean, but that is again, just if it was actually in this maximum mixed state. Right, we're, we're having to consider that it's maximally mixed state because we want to be open to the possibility that there's a firewall and, and determining whether there's a firewall or not. Um, but if it actually turns out that it was just the post collapse state and nothing weird had happened to it, then there's no firewall. You just jump in and, and you just see that there's no firewall. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that's, that's actually in this state. It seems you can think about it either way, right? You can either say uh, firewall. I mean, this is kind yeah. of state, this is kind of an avatar of state dependence in this in this in this uh, even you know for this simple black. It's hole, it's certainly it's yeah. I, I certainly agree. It's in some sense an avatar of state dependence. Um, but I, I think uh, yeah, at least at this level, I would say you know this this is the state you're considering the state because it's the state of your knowledge before you're jumping in, and you're like, oh, it could have a firewall, it could not. We don't know. So this, the state of my knowledge is it's a mixed state that could have either. But then you jump in, if there's not a firewall, you just see there's not a firewall. Um, yeah, the, the other thing I would say is, is, I think you were saying, you know, isn't really the interior mode the thing that purifies the, the exterior partner? I would say to that, definitely no. I mean, like, like it is in a post-collapse state, but it, in, in this state, we've like disentangled those two. And the, the, yeah, at least when they're low energy, then you can do that. Now, if you go into the past, then they become transplantian. Uh, if various things happen, it becomes a white hole, blah, blah, blah. But um, yeah, maybe we could, we could talk about that question more offline. But uh, I think at least the, the simple question is, is, no, they're just disentangled. Uh -huh. uh, there's one more question, Suvrat. Yeah, hi. Uh, I, I actually had a very similar question to that of Daniel, and maybe I can make it a little sharper. Uh, so if you were to consider these states where these modes are disentangled, uh, there would be a, a contribution to the stress tensor and that uh, would back react on the metric and would also change your area term. So, so you know, you took into account the change in delta S due to the, the disentanglement, but I was confused why you didn't have to take into account the change in delta E because there would be a strong back reaction on the metric. Yeah, great question. Um, so, okay, so, so there's a certain amount of ambiguity in how you, you gravitationally address this change. 
uh, one nice way to do so is you can you can disentangle these two modes just by basically um, acting with a, a random choice of unitary on this exterior mode and then then averaging over all those different choices of unitary. Okay, so that will that will that will disentangle them. Uh, and with that particular gravitational dressing, then just by causality, then then it can't change the the local geometry over near the surface gamma. Uh, and so this geometry near the surface gamma will be will be completely unchanged. Uh, it will the the geometry sort of back here will be completely changed. And in fact, in this this maximally mixed state, what will happen is with high probability, if you evolve back in time, you'll get a white hole, and and you know you need to have that happen because this thing can't be causally separated from the boundary. Um, but the, the geometry near, near gamma, uh, you know, depending on how you gravitationally dress it, there can be no back reaction at all. And even if you gravitationally dress it a different way, then I think the back reaction would be, would be negligible there. Or, or, unless you do something weird, it would be negligible. There. So yeah, very good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, ben, if it's a really quick question, you can have it now. If not, we can leave it for the discussion perhaps tomorrow. But if it's a quick it's question, a very quick question. I don't know if the answer is quick. It seems like you developed the tools <laughs> to answer the question whether a generic pure state has a firewall, and uh, what is the <laughs> answer to that? Um, it is not a quick question. I'm not sure we fully. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think we fully develop the tools to answer that because you know we're starting from a bulk state and then then asking questions about that bulk state. I think when I, I always get unhappy with this. This so to me, I only know how to talk about a generic state from a boundary point of view rather than a, a, a bulk point of view. I'm not sure what I mean generic state from the bulk. That's I guess the question. Um, and it's not clear to me that a generic boundary state has one unique like preferred bulk description. Uh, it seems to me that it might have a load of different equally horrible equivalent bulk descriptions. Um, but that that that's all I'm going to say because otherwise we're going to get way too far in the weeds and uh, yeah uh, I'll get in trouble. So thanks. Yeah. Well, because we don't want Jeff to get in trouble, uh, let us give the floor now to the organizers for the discussion session that that comes afterwards. Great. Oh.